So, we've heard a lot of great things about culture uh, yesterday, and today I'm here to talk a little bit about tools, uh, a little bit about Docker, and actually this talk is a bit of a misnomer because it's really not about deploying uh, Docker at all. It's mostly about provisioning with Docker, and depending on whether or not uh, I can uh, stay under my time limit, we might actually talk a little bit about deploying it. Um, and as anyone knows from yesterday, I'm a liar uh, from Werewolf. So, okay. <laughs> yeah, so I want to talk a little bit about uh, sh uh, cooking at home or, or cooking versus chefs. Uh, dev testing production environments um, look a lot like a, in many cases, look like a home cook's kitchen. Uh, you, you build a recipe and you expect it to be repeatable. You say, Here, here's what I want, this is the recipe I'm gonna build. Um, and of course, this w analogy works with Chef as well, the, the softer Chef. Um, that you're going to build a recipe and you're gonna expect to run it, it's gonna be repeatable. But how often is that really true? Because PyPI is going to, to go down, uh, the, the Debian uh, servers are gonna go down, uh, RPM servers are gonna go down, packages are going to change, versions and dependencies are going to change. Um, and those edge cases can introduce incompatibilities in your software. Of course, this stuff never actually happens in real life, right? <laughs> um, of course it does. So, you real chefs, right, not cooks, chefs keep their ingredients on hand. They have prepared kitchens. They have all the tools and ingredients at their disposal all the times. And if they don't, then suddenly they can no longer make that meal and they just they move on to another meal. They don't run out to the store and, and grab the thing that they need. Um, or if they do, they have some helper do it. Um, when you're trying to deploy things in production and you're running a cloud and you're trying to scale out your, uh, your architecture and you find that the, the PyPI servers are down because you, and you can't converge your chef recipes or your puppet uh, scripts that suddenly you can't scale, right? Because you have this, uh, you've created another problem for yourself, which is that now you cannot actually install this automation that you've put together. So Docker has, provides some ways of alleviating these problems for you. Uh, it sounds like everybody here knows what Docker is. Uh, it is not just Linux containers and namespaces and, and security, but it's also the packaging and bundling and imaging uh, of, of your applications and making them portable between your systems and being able to send them to places. And you can run them locally, uh, test them, send them to CI, and send them into production and be the same environment with the same dependencies and all the ingredients baked in. So, you might ask, why do we need things like Chef and Puppet? And it's pretty simple. You already use these tools. You already know these tools. And, you're, and you may be solving complex problems that these tools do well at solving. They may not be the only solution, but they're a solution. And certainly uh, better than some of the alternatives. We have Docker files. Docker files are these uh, basically recipes for building Docker images and they themselves uh, are powerful in a way, and they're great for installing things and doing very basic configuration management. You can say, run this script, run set, I'm gonna uh, exchange these configuration variables, I'm gonna do a C uh, preprocessor macros or something and change these files. That's fine to a certain point. Uh, so this, this guy here actually is in the audience. Uh, he was wearing the shirt, there he is. Uh, he was wearing this shirt yesterday. Um, <laughs> actually, the slide got out of order. Uh, but <laughs> so the the Docker file basically has these. Uh, it's almost like running shell scripts, right? Uh, you have the ability to run different commands, and those commands may be uh, shell scripts. They might be. You can break those scripts even in Go or Ruby, Python, whatever but you would have to actually write those things and write system management tools 
And at some point you start reinventing the wheel if you're doing things that are sufficiently complex. Uh, one of the nice things about doing Docker files is that they are effectively idempotent because every time you run it, you're starting from scratch. You're not just building on top of what you had before and reconverging something. You're just going to destroy what you had, uh, your previous image, and you start from a new image. So I love Bash. Um, it's fine. You can write good things in Bash. Uh, you can write code that looks good in Bash. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that people are going to like you for it, uh, but you can do it. The problem is that at some point, uh, people become really unhappy with scripts that are 15,000 lines of bash, and you wonder, how did we ever get to this point? Uh, this particular script has 263 contributors. Uh, this is uh, an OpenStack project. Um, and so at this point, right, you start wondering, are we doing DevOps or are we doing crazy sauce? Because you need, you know, you, you do need to actually have tools, right? Like good working tools. Um, it, it is about culture, but it, it's about not doing crazy shit either. So, I'm going to use a lot of examples of chef in this talk just because I had to pick something. Uh, and when I say chef, I really mean puppet. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, I had to pick, pick something to make my bad examples with. Uh, so this is one way of installing chef in a Docker file. It's really simple. You just install it, and I'll be in your image. You can use Omnibus. I don't care. So to explain how we can use Chef with Docker, I'd like to cover a little bit about how, um, how Docker or how Docker changes your runtime. So this would be your traditional environment, and you may not be able to read this text, but basically you, you have hardware, you're installing and running an OS on it, you run Chef or, or Puppet on your, on your OS, and it's going to modify your file system. That seems pretty straightforward. But it's changing the initial state, right? You have all these problems of idempotency and whether or not I can rerun those chef recipes and maintain my system. Uh, images, um, right, so it's basically mutable. So what's happening, is this is another way of kind of extracting this concept, which is that it is creating a new state of the file system. It's creating a new image. When you, after you run chef, it's almost as if if I was looking from a Docker, pers Docker perspective or a copy and write perspective, I'm creating a new image. Every time I run Chef or Puppet, I'm creating a new image. But that image, uh, in the traditional hardware sense, is being written back and overwriting the original image. The original image is gone. I mean, there are ways of getting around this, of course. You can use uh, ZFS, uh, ButterFS. Uh, Project Atomic is kind of looking at changing this. Uh, paradigm uh, in a more like everybody who uses Project Atomic as their OS is going to kind of get this built in that every time they run Chef they're just going to have a completely new image um, and that's great and we can uh, you know that's going to bridge the gap I think between containers and hardware because um, so this is the the ephemeral environment, a VM environment. So this is saying we're going to take an image and we're going to run a VM off this image, but the image is based on an image that we download. We're going to say this is an image in the cloud, this is what we're booting off of, and we are really going to run a copy of that. The original image has never changed, right? And when we run Chef, we're, running, or we're changing our image, but when we shut down our VM and start a new one, we're based on the original image, right? We're starting from scratch, right? And I think hardware is going to get to this point. Um, it kind of is now if you roll it yourself. It's just that those the operating systems are kind of redesigning themselves so that this is a model that isn't just at a launch VM uh, model, but it's a your OS. You know, it's built into your OS. So Docker kind of fits into this model as well, where. You can build things uh, inside the container, 
and I and I should make a distinction between containers and images, right? So the container would be like a VM. So you can build things inside that container, but when you destroy the container, those all that state disappears, unless you want to save it. So you can actually commit that image. You can say, I just built this thing inside this container, and this gives me, you know you know, state, a derivative state, and I'm going to save that now as a new image, and that's going to be my new image and my new base. So practically, doing this in a Docker file would look something like this, and you would say, I'm going to add these recipes and run Chef Solo, and this is going to run when, so the command option here at the end says, these are the things, this is going to happen when I actually run this image, and the last part is going to actually run at the time that is a container uh, at runtime. And by the way, like you know, I don't care. Like you know, Burk, you can use Burke Shelf and all sorts of things. It's just an example. Um, so Docker builds in in layers, and after you have done that, you can you can save the state. But I want to kind of uh, go off the rails a little bit here and talk about kittens. Uh, so this is basically going, to, this is kind of an embedded, uh, almost like a ignite in, in the middle of my talk. So we're going to talk about cats. And I want to just say how running the, your, your runtime state and modifying your image in a self-manipulating, self-modifying behavior is like taking care of your, cat, of your pets. Uh, you, you feed it, you, you pet it, you care for it. Uh, you know, the, the typical hardware OS model uh, where you run Chef and modifies your system. But what we want to really do, right, is wrangle our cattle. We're in the cloud, the pets versus cattle, and we, we, we want the cattle model where we're just going to create lots of these things and we're going to scale out. But is that really true anymore? Because the Internet of Things is coming. So we have devices and nodes, and these things may be ephemeral. They may come online for a few minutes at a time, they may be on for days and hours at a time. We don't really know. These things may not be incredibly powerful. They may be Raspberry Pis. They may be uh, the Intel Galileos, which are like uh, very small embedded x86 processors that are equivalent of like, I don't know, early Pentium chips, but you can buy them for like $30. And you're going to find these things inside of your coffee machines and, and so forth. The problem is that these things are not yet powerful enough in order for us to do this runtime configuration, we're going to want to build these images and have as much done uh, before even sending the image and running the image on these devices as possible. And this really works in the cloud too, right? Uh, we're going to have you have the case where you want to scale up quickly. You don't want to have to be waiting for everything to download off of your Pi PI mirrors or um, download gems, right? You want to just have everything baked in, um, and we're going to be. And these, the Internet of Things is going to include things like Juniper switches and Cisco switches. It's not just uh, coffee makers, um, right? And and even cows, right? So just just to go back to the cows for a moment, you know, they take time to to, to raise. They're expensive to raise and build up. So we're going to build them in. And containers are things, right? Can, every container that you build is a thing. It is something that we can have an inventory for, that we can know where it is, that we can uh, modify, and, and uh, it it's going to have state. They're not kittens. They're not cows. They're all the things. So I just want to kind of end my uh, little mini Ignite on, you know, it's no longer pets versus cattle, it's servers versus things. So we need to start thinking of our VMs and our containers as things and not as servers. We need to start thinking them of them as things and not cattle because cattle are expensive to raise. They're hard to, to bring up. We want things that are just, they're more ephemeral than, than even cows. So our intermission is, is over. Uh, so to go back to baking, right, we're, we, we want now our bakery chefs, right? We don't just want 
chefs that have a kitchen and they're going to cook whatever they want. We have to bake things better. Um, we're going to build these images with all the things that we want in them. Um, containers are like those ephemeral VMs. So what we can do uh, practically with Chef is run Chef in the, in the process and not do a command in Docker, but we can run that command during the build and say this is going to, this run command basically says create a container that runs Chef Solo, configures that container, and then saves that, and our final image that we're baking is going to be the result of the output of that container meaning that we're going to build the container and we're going to save the state and that is our new image. Right, so this basically creates that image right there in the, the third the vertical one there. And uh, just give you a moment to look at that. So this is a, a more expanded model of how Docker works, right? It's going to initiate, Docker initiates a build, it's going to create an image, Chef runs, you get a derivative image, and then that derivative image is used for the image tag, and the image tag is a reference to what is the actual image that we're creating, because every time that we run something, every time we create a container, it basically creates an image, it's just a matter of which ones we tag and say are important. So we're going to run Chef and then we're going to say the output of that Chef, that's important. That's what we're going to save. That's what we're going to run uh, from now on. So just because we're bakery chefs doesn't mean that we can't add uh, peanut butter and jelly to our sandwich, right? Like we can still do things inside of that container after we have baked it. We do not want to make sandwiches. Right? We don't want egg and salmon and tomato on this sandwich. We just want some bread and butter. Uh, because again, you know, we don't want to we want to bake in as much as we as we can. There are times that we're going to want to say this image um, does this generic thing, let's say it's an Apache container or Apache image, and when we run it, we're going to give it some static HTML files, or we're going to give it uh, a, a domain name. And these are things that we can use, say, Chef, to actually bit configure at runtime that don't make sense to configure when we bake, the, when we bake it, but they're low key enough, they're, they're small enough that it doesn't matter uh, that, that we're doing it at runtime. So this would just be a model of basically doing a two stage. We're going to build an image, and then we're going to run Chef inside of it at runtime. Uh, basically having an ephemeral configuration on the far right. Uh, practically this would look like this, which is we have two stages. We have uh, a Chef Solo uh, stage one, Chef Solo stage two. We run one, and we, we, which creates, bakes it into the image, and the second one, the command at the very bottom, is going to run this when we run, when we create the container. Uh, and you can also see here that we're effectively letting Chef Solo finish, and then we're starting Apache. So this is just, again, a, a model. You know, the specifics of how you run Chef Solo or Puppet, if you're going to use Berkshelf and, and so forth, um, are really up to you. This is just kind of a template. And I just kind of wanted to add here, right, that when you're doing this, you can actually use this for, as part of your CI for your Chef. So you can, or, or your puppet, and you can say, we're going to build this image, and if it fails to build, then that means a chef didn't converge, which is actually kind of nice. Um, so, all right, we have enough time, we can actually talk about deploying Docker. Um, I will blow through these slides, though, because they're probably more descriptive than you need them to be. Basically, it's really easy to run Docker containers. So we can just run something on EC2, uh, we can knife something onto EC2. We can use Puppet to create containers on machines that we are already controlling via Puppet. 
We can, if you're using OpenStack, you can use heat, and that's going to communicate to VMs or bare metal, and it talks to the Docker daemon, and this would be your config to create a bunch of instances on the host and do some stuff with it. Ansible, uh, you can manage Docker containers, create them with Ansible. And with all of these other things as well, right? Um, we have someone from Flynn here. Uh, there's Mesos, OpenShift, Cloud Foundry, Diaz, a bunch of PaaS products and ecosystem things coming around Docker. So the point is that it's really easy to create these containers. Managing them kind of sucks um, or needs improvement. And if you're using a PaaS, uh, which is tracking these things for you in these containers, it's easy. But if you're building your own little intercloud on top of um, EC2 or Rackspace and you're saying, I'm going to create a bunch of VMs and I'm going to launch some containers on there, um, and you don't, it's not a one-to-one -one mapping of one VM to a container, then you now have this management problem, right? You say, um, this is going to... Uh, th this, this host has this many machines and so forth. And unless you're using a PaaS, it's really hard to keep track of that. So there are some solutions for container inventory. Um, they should be better, but they're not. Uh, there is DiscoverD uh, SDUtil that um, is part of uh, Flynn, but they can be used uh, independently. Uh, there's Surf, there's Skydoc, um, and there's others uh, uncertain, right? There's also things that you can build into your app. So if you are fully in control of your app stack, then you can use uh, some sort of distributed consensus algorithms like Raft and say, these are the machines that are part of my deployment and that's fine, but it doesn't necessarily help you with arbitrary Docker containers or with uh, things that you may not necessarily control or you don't want to build them into your container for whatever reason. So in summary, Containers are not kittens, they're not cattle. Draw the effing owl, <laughs> bake it into your images, and enjoy your meal. So if there's any questions. Yeah. we're wondering about, we've been considering moving over to, to Docker and deploying on Elastic Beanstalk. And one of the things that's not clear to me, we currently use uh, <clears throat> other long running processes to monitor things, do centralized logging, for instance, Logstash. And one of the things I was wondering is, uh, what are things, what are people doing for centralized logging on Docker containers? How are they getting logs off of there and shoving them into things like Elasticsearch? Thanks. Um, so syslog is one obvious solution. Right, you can send to a remote syslog server and aggregate that way. Um, there are a number of people that are looking, that are building and looking at building logging solutions for Docker uh, that are going to make that more friendly and easier. Uh, you know, because there's also Docker logs, right? You can get the logs of a of a container uh, from the host without, or you know, from the process that's running in the host, right? Which is the SCD in, SCD out, um, and not the syslog. So. That, like I said, there are, there are solutions. I think there may be at least one R syslog uh, image as well, where you can basically say, this is going to attach to these, uh, the, out, the, the logs of this other container, and then send that out to the R syslog. Um, so these solutions kind of exist, but you're right, it's probably worth like somebody giving a talk on that as well, and highlighting all the really useful things, because I think you, somebody could probably talk like 20 minutes about that. Any other questions? Okay. Well, thank you.